Um, thank you for coming. I hope, um, as we get started here, I, I'm going to do my best to not walk around because Dale hates that uh, <laughs> when he's trying to record me. So I'm going to try to stay put. I'm also going to try to finish in a uh, reasonable amount of time to allow for questions. Uh, please feel free to ask me anything. If we get a little bit of a, a little bit ahead of ourselves, because this is a four week series, I will sort of telegraph that to you and answer your question anyway, but try to reserve some fodder for future weeks. I, I think I should probably start off by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, <clears throat> I was not raised in a Christian home. I became a Christian later as a teenager. And to sort of succinctly summarize my situation, it was fairly hostile <laughs> uh, toward uh, the gospel, toward anything uh, in, with respect to Christianity. But when I became a Christian, um, I just sort of got absorbed into the study of Scripture. And I was the kid who would take commentaries to study hall in high school and read them. In other words, there was like a suicide watch on me. <laughs> uh, and I was unusual, uh, but I just, I loved it. And I felt called to do biblical studies full time. And one of the things that I was exposed to and learned pretty quickly was that you could more or less let God defend himself. Uh, he doesn't need to be defended, even though we have these impulses, you know, to defend him, to defend the Bible, and, you know, sort of go to bat for God and that sort of thing. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but one of the things I want to get across in the four weeks is that one of the best things you can do is just let God be God and let the Bible be what it is. You will be amazed at how disarming that can be to people who would be antagonistic toward it. Now, having said that, uh, there will be some things. I'm going to telegraph this much. There will be some things that I know as I look out at you and try to see you despite the lights in my eyes that I'm going to see some furrowed brows. I'm going to see some expressions like, what in the world is this guy talking about? It's happened. I was, I was there the night Mike finally lost his mind. Uh, you might think that, but I want you to bear with me. I, I believe in all the things that I'm assuming that those of you who are here believe in. Uh, yeah, I'm a Semitic scholar. Yeah, I went to really antagonistic uh, Universities, University of Wisconsin, perhaps the most liberal institution in the country. Uh, University of Pennsylvania, the Ivy League. These are not friendly places toward what you would think of as traditional, uh, traditional Christianity, traditional view of the Bible. Uh, I, I'm glad I went to those places because they sharpened me in ways that I wouldn't have gotten going anywhere else. I still use words like inspiration. I still use words like inerrancy. Now, I'll grant you that I might define them in, in a way that you don't or somebody else wouldn't, but you would be amazed for people who would call themselves evangelical and who are scholars. They just don't like those terms. And during the course of the four weeks, you'll, I'll, I'll hit on some of those things too, and you'll see why. But my goal for tonight is that I want you to, to get an understanding of how those who spend time in the text, specifically the Hebrew text, how they look at Genesis. Why is it? Okay, how many of you know who Bruce Waltke is? How many of you have heard the name? Okay, maybe a quarter of you. Bruce Waltke is a very famous evangelical Old Testament scholar that recently uh, got into some trouble. In other words, people didn't like what he said uh, about his comments on Genesis, saying things like, oh, essentially, who really cares if evolution turns out to be right? I still believe scripture. I still believe in inspiration. And in the minds of many people, those, those two things are completely incompatible. Why is it a guy like Waltke, who's a Hebrew scholar, can say that? 
Why is it if you picked up a study Bible and you read you know, notes on Genesis 1 or you have a little commentary or some Bible handbook or something, you'll see a, you know, a small grocery listing of views as to how to take Genesis 1. How is it that people who have equal theological commitments can come out with positions that just seem completely incompatible? And, and frankly, to some degree, they are incompatible, but they're all held sincerely by people who take the, the Scripture seriously. In other words, they're not trying to be buddies with the unbelieving scientific world. Okay? They're still saying this is the Word of God. Okay? God is the source. We, we believe in inspiration. We believe that what it says is, is true and correct. But they don't have any problem necessarily with things like evolution. Why is that? I'm going to show you why that is tonight. So I have a simple goal. I think I'll be able to walk you through that. Uh, usually it's one of those, you know, I, I run the risk of, of having the outcome be, well, I came here thinking that was clear, and as usual, it takes a scholar to really mess things up. Okay, I hope that will not be the way you feel tonight. I want you to understand why there is this difference and why it's legitimate, okay, why you really can have more than one view of what's going on in Genesis 1 and orient your view, base your view on the text, has nothing to do with science or making scientists happy. It's about the text. So there are a few things that probably you came here thinking, yeah, if I you know, could guess what Mike's going to talk about, it would be you know, these, these sorts of things. And so I'm going to disabuse you of certain things right away. Uh, we'll return uh, briefly to a couple of these. But I would classify certain things that usually get talked about in relationship to how do we understand Genesis 1 as important, but lacking certainty and not central. One of these is what does bara mean? Okay, the word create. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word for created there is bara. There's, always, there's a big fight over you know, what does bara mean? You have some saying it, it means creation out of nothing. Okay, this is the initial creation event, completely out of nothing. This is when matter is created. And you get somebody on the other side uh, who doesn't really care what bara means. Okay, they, a Christian, you know, somebody like a Hugh Ross would embrace the Big Bang and you know, be trying to fit that into Genesis and so on and so forth. They don't really care about bara. In fact, they would deny that it means creation out of nothing. Okay, so it, it's essentially a stalemate. I'll tell you what, what my thoughts are on that as we go, but that's peripheral. The meaning of yom, which is the Hebrew word for day. There's a big fight that occurs over this word. The days in Genesis 1 are literal 24-hour days. That's what yom means. It, is, it means that especially when it's, when it's partnered with a number, it has to be 24 hours. There's no other way to look at it. Okay? Those things I just said are not necessarily true. And so they wind up being peripheral to the real issue because there are people on both sides who will argue meanings for Yom on both sides, and all of the views are legitimate. So you don't really get anywhere. And again, we'll return to that in a bit. But what I really want to zero in on, and if you're not catatonic in the next 10 seconds, when I mention English grammar, you'll probably get through the rest of the night. <laughs> it's about grammar. And you can see it in English. Okay? Clause structure is the key to understanding why Genesis 1, 1 through 3 can be taken a variety of ways. That's the key. And that's the thing nobody looks at unless you're a grammar geek. Okay? Unless you're somebody who spends time doing you know, Hebrew things, working in the Hebrew text. Then you're confronted with it immediately. But in English Bibles... It just depends on the translation. A clause is, we kind of think of it as a sentence, a group of related words containing a subject and verb. Easy. We all know that. It may or may not express a complete thought. Okay, a clause can do either. A verb might be present or it might be understood. And we've all, especially you homeschoolers who've had to teach your kids English grammar, you know about understood subjects and understood verbs, things that just aren't there in the text, but you kind of know because you know English that they belong there. Same thing happens in Hebrew. There are independent clauses, and these are clauses that contain a subject and a verb and express a complete thought. 
Okay, store that away in your mind. Independent clauses express a complete thought. They stand alone. They don't need anything else to express the complete thought. Example, Jim studied in his room for his chemistry exam. It's a complete thought. It's not giving you the impression that you're missing any information in order to completely understand it. Okay? It, it stands alone. It's complete. There are dependent clauses, though, that don't stand alone, don't stand by themselves. You have a subject and a verb, but you don't have a complete thought. If I add one word to what you just saw, when Jim studied in his room for his chemistry exam, what? I mean, it feels like there's something that is supposed to come afterward to complete the idea. Just by adding that one word, it has a sense of incompletion. It has a sense of lacking something else. That, okay, finish the idea. So you have two kinds of clauses. Complete contained idea and something else that depends on something else, some other part of what you're reading for you to get a complete idea. So here we have them side by side or juxtaposed. The only difference is the one word, when. When Jim studied in his room for his chemistry exam, he was able to concentrate. Now, we have the full picture. We have the full idea. And in fact, the underlying part here, he was able to concentrate. That actually could stand by itself. He was able to concentrate. You could put something before it, too. His brother stayed away when Jim studied in his room for his chemistry exam. That gives you a complete, and it gives you a fullness. You're not looking for something else, which is the basic idea. In a dependent situation, a dependent clause, you feel like you've got to have something else to get the full idea. Now, we, we know this. This is English grammar. We can intuitively feel when, when, when we need more information and when we don't. This same situation happens in the first three verses of Genesis. There are a series of clauses, and the question is, which ones can stand alone and which ones depend on the others for their meaning? And I'll show you how that works in a second. So again, we have a, something at the end, something at the beginning that completes the thought. So the question is, independent or dependent? And once we know that, we'll know what the main idea of the cluster, the full idea, the full sentence or sentences, we'll know what the main idea is or isn't. We'll know what describes what and what is described. Here's the first verse of Genesis. Does that sound like a complete idea? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Sure, it can stand alone. Verse 2 starts, Now the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Complete or incomplete? How many vote for complete? How many vote for incomplete? Why the feeling of incompleteness? The first word, now. If we start with the word now, or even and, if, especially if it was and, some translations have and, that just sort of puts it in your and. Well, that means something like came bef before. Now, I wouldn't say ob uh, obscures that because you still get the same feeling that, well, I really wasn't supposed to start here. There's probably something else that came before. Okay, just a little bit of a feeling there in English. After this group of words, this clause, 
we have, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And we have and at the beginning, so that sort of gives us a clue that it belongs with something else, something that preceded it. And of course, we have the first half of verse 2. And together, they do rather nicely. We have clear thoughts, but it's that word now, okay, that just sort of, I don't quite, I don't know if it's, if I should take it independently or dependently. It's just, oh, I don't know what to do with it. You know, if we took the word now off, the earth was, then it would, then it would just feel like it, like it's standalone. But now it's there, and it's there in Hebrew as well. Verse three, and God said, let there be light. Okay, the and implies continuation, but by itself, let there be light. That's a complete thought. And there was light. Notice I've taken the punctuation off the ends deliberately. Okay. And there was light. Okay. Now here's one way to look at the first three verses. I have the second verse in blue for a reason. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. What is the role of verse 2? Does it proceed from verse 1? Or does it do something else? Do we have a sequence, a chronology, or do we have something else? Mike, you look like you want to. <laughs> now creates a question. Some some sort of, is it a sequence or not? Go ahead. Okay, now there's an important word and idea, backgrounding. What is being background, backgrounded? Is verse 1 being backgrounded? Or is verse 3 being backgrounded? In other words, do we have a linear sequence of events? Is that how we're supposed to look at it? Or do we have, okay, first, verse 1 happens, God creates heavens and the earth. Then, the earth was out without form and void, as, as though that's the result of verse 1. And then verse 3 follows. It's a linear sequence. 2 is the result of 1, 3 follows 2. No kidding, Mike, it's 1, 2, 3. <laughs> All right, you can count. Is that the way we're supposed to look at it? Now, traditionally, that is how Genesis 1, 1 through 3 has been understood. 2 is the result of verse 1. That's the traditional interpretation. In the beginning, God creates, created the heavens and the earth. That is viewed as the first creative act in the traditional way of interpreting it. God does something in verse 1. The result of that is the conditions, are the conditions we see in verse 2. The writer kind of lets us know what the result of God's creating in verse 1 was. And then he moves on to God getting down to business in verse 3. Okay, So God creates the heavens and the earth, and oh, by the way, when he did that, the earth was with formless and empty, you know, and all these conditions. And then God said, let there be light, and we get down to business. Okay, that's the traditional way of looking at it. Let me go back here a second. So we have independent clauses in verses 1 and 3, and dependent in 2, and the dependent is the result. That's the relationship. So here we have, I have grayed out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the translation we're used to. But now let's play around a little bit. What if I translated it this way? When God began to create the heavens and the earth, you say, well, that's cheating. You can't do that. <laughs> yes, I can. I have a PhD in Hebrew. I can do whatever. 
No, seriously, if you look in the Jewish Publication Society translation of Genesis 1-1, that's it. When God began to create the heavens and the earth. Now, is that a complete thought or an incomplete thought? That one's certainly incomplete because it's prepping something to follow. You're being prepped as a reader. So when you put the word when in front of it, you know that it's just leading to something. It's not an independent thought or act. It's leading to one that you haven't gotten to yet. Now let's put them side by side, or I'll get there eventually. We have in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, that's the traditional translation that most of us are used to. The Hebrew consonants are as follows. You know, Hebrew, of course, was not written with any vowels. I have added a vowel here in red. If I was a Hebrew scribe using the vowel system that was invented at around the 8th century A.D., those are the only vowels we have, you know, those little dots and squiggles that you see on a Hebrew text, the vowel system. If I wanted to be sure that my reader would understand I'm talking about the beginning, in the beginning, I would use that little mark that looks like a capital T. And it would be pronounced ba reshit. That's called in Hebrew the definite article. Just like English definite article, the word for the. Okay, that's all it is. Now, if I wanted to opt for when God began, it would look this way be two dots underneath. And that means there is no definite article. It's just another, it's a vocal cue that we don't have a definite article here. That would be be reshit. Which one do you think is in your Hebrew Bible? The Hebrew Bible that like everybody uses now that has come down to us from from centuries ago, the Dead Sea Scrolls do not have vowels. Vowels only start again in the Middle Ages, late antiquity. Which one do you think we get in Hebrew texts that have vowels? The capital T, how many vote for capital T? We've got to vote for capital T. <laughs> how many vote for the two dots? The indefinite one. We've got four, oh, two dots wins, four to one. Uh, no, let me show you. Let me show you which one we have here. I'm going to go to Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. This is the German Bible Society edition. It's Be Reshit. The translation, when God began to create, is a completely legitimate translation. In fact, it more accurately reflects the Masoretic text, the traditional Hebrew text that we have. Now, you could just as well say, and trust me, some do, that, well, it didn't have vowels to begin with, so we should put ba, reshit, in there and be definite in the beginning, first creative act. Sure, you can say that. The only problem is you, is you don't have a single manuscript that does have vowels that has that, like zero. And I bring that up because it's something to store, store away in your mind because we're fond, as evangelicals, we're fond of saying things like, oh, those Hebrew scribes were so good at what they did. The Dead Sea Scrolls show that 99.9% .9 accuracy in transmission and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they do. Hebrew scribes didn't, like, lose their brains in the Middle Ages, okay? They're, they're just as good then as they were at the time of Qumran. So it's cheating to just say, well, I like that other vowel better. I can have that because it's not original. Yeah, you can. But there is no tradition that supports it. And that's what we have for the Hebrew Bible. We have scribal tradition for its, the way it's vocalized. So let's go back here. we got two possible translations. If we opt for the when translation, 
Now look, I've changed the colors. Now we have dependent clauses. We don't have a series of independent ideas. We have two full verses of clauses that are leading up to something. And that something is verse 3, and that is the main idea. That's the independent thought. So here, just think about it. Read, you can, you know, read along with me or in your mind, and just think about how it sounds. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, now the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. It really has a different feel. It, it, it sounds like everything in verses 1 and 2 are just prep. They're, they're not really happening. They're, they're the writer describing what conditions, now catch this, the writer is describing conditions that already exist before God actually creates anything, before God actually speaks anything into existence. In other words, you have a situation where verses 1 and 2 lead to verse 3, and they set it up. The first creative act, the first thing God does in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, in this view, is not verse 1. It's verse 3. That's the very first thing that God speaks into existence. For lack of a better term, I couldn't think of anything that's very witty or alliterated. I put Hebrew syntax view because this is strict Hebrew syntax. Syntax is sentence structure, sentence relationships. If you're going to just go by what the Hebrew says, like a zealot, strictly, obeying the rules of Hebrew grammar, that is what you get. And that's why some English Bibles have that. The, the new RSV, I wish I would have put this up, the new, the new RSV kind of combines them. It says something like, in the beginning when God created, I mean, it, it merges them together. So it's like, hey, we can please everybody here. Uh, it's kind of an interesting <clears throat> interesting tactic. But, you know, translators have to, especially with this verse, they're sensitive because we have this verse, you know, like, like verses like John 3.16, we got this one in our heads. And so to render it really differently, you know, that might you know, bother some people. The JPS, uh, Jewish Publication Society, didn't really care about that. What's the importance? Again, another way of looking at the information is that the traditional view has a chronological sequence. God's first creative act is in verse 1. He creates everything. Verse 2, that's the result. That's what we get. Verse 3, God says, okay, back to work. Let there be light. The other view says, well, let me tell you a story. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, and, you know, now when he, when he got on the job site, the earth was already formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then God said, time to get to work. Let there be light. It's a completely different feel. If you take the alternate view, it allows these assertions about what's happening in Genesis 1, 1 through 3. Genesis 1, 1 is not the absolute beginning. And Genesis 1, 1 through 3 describes an ordering or a fashioning, doing something with matter that already existed. Now that, of course, raises what obvious question? Well, where'd that come from? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, if something's already there, like, who put that there? Okay, and why do we ask that question? I can tell you right now, a Semite, an ancient Israelite, would have looked at you, in this case, it's my wife, and said, what are you talking about? Who cares? What a pointless question. We ask that question, why? Because we're moderns and we're thinking scientifically. 
we've got to account for that. I've got to account for that pre-existing matter. What do I do? What do I do? I, you know, I got to ask that question because, you know, scientifically we know that you know matter isn't just there. I mean, it's got to start from you know. That's what's going through our heads because we have both the benefit and the curse of modern scientific thinking. Okay. Different things are firing in our heads than you know, an ancient Israelite would have kind of given you a blank stare. And we'll talk about why he would give you a blank stare in the next couple of weeks. Let's go back to Barah. Well, doesn't Barah settle this? I mean, Barah is in verse 1. And that has to mean creation out of nothing. So that solves it. That takes care of the ambiguity. End of story. Sit down, Mike. Okay, end of story. It's all settled with Barah. Oh, if only it were that easy. <laughs> if only it were that easy. Barah does not inherently mean creation from nothing. And I'm going to show you that if you insist on that, be prepared for a contradiction in your Bible between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Now, you may like contradictions in the Bible. I'm willing almost to say that's not a sin. <laughs> uh, you may like that or not be troubled by it at all. I don't like contradictions in the Bible. Not only do I have theological problems with it, but my mind just doesn't like stuff like that. I, I've, I've got to kind of settle it somewhere, somehow. But I, you know, I can live with ambiguity. I just don't want contradiction. Ambiguity and contradiction are two entirely different things. Okay? Let me show you a few things. We'll go to... Uh, we're going to work here. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Right down here, I'm going to click on the word created. And I hope you can see the highlighting. You probably can't. But created right here is the word bara. You can see it in the right-hand pane. So we have God's, you know, announces to his heavenly host. That's how I take Genesis 1, 26. It says, I've got a great idea. Let's make humankind in our image in our likeness. And so verse 27, God gets down to business and God baraz humankind in his own image. Now here's a question. I, I, I want to say it's not a trick question, but it kind of is. <laughs> Does bara, can bara mean creation out of nothing here? either in this case. Was humankind created out of nothing? That's correct. <laughs> Genesis 2.7. Here, I'll answer the question. We go down to chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. Adam didn't get here being created out of nothing. Did Eve? No. Verse 22, Eve is created from a portion of Adam's side. So in both cases, God is using material that was already there, dust, Adam's side, to create humankind. Now that should tell us, if we go back up here. Am I going the right direction? No, I'm not. Okay. Let's just scroll. Quickly. We go back up to verse 27. God created man in his own, own image. Bara here cannot mean creation out of nothing. This is why I cautioned you. If you're going to insist that this word has to be understood as creation out of nothing, you've got a real problem here. You've got two creation accounts that are diametrically opposed, and you can say, well, they might be from two sources. And you know, I'm, I'm not hostile to you know, two traditions that someone put together. I'm not hostile to that. What I am hostile to is 
You can't have it either way or both ways. You can't have one that, that says, absolutely, God didn't use anything to create humanity, and the other one says he did. Okay, that's clearly contradictory. The solution is very simple. Just admit that bara doesn't mean have to mean creation out of nothing. Now, it, it might somewhere. Okay, and of course, our minds go back to Genesis 1.1. Does it mean creation out of nothing there? Well, again, if you're... If you take the second view of the clauses, you would say it doesn't mean creation out of nothing there either because God isn't creating in verse 1. That's set up to verse 3. And you don't have a contradiction there if you take that view, but you do have the idea that God doesn't start doing what he's doing until verse 3. Now, the other verse I had here is Exodus 20, verse 11. If we go back to our interlinear here, in Genesis 2-7, I should just click there probably quicker just to do that. In Genesis 2-7, we have the Lord God formed. That's a word, yatsar. In Genesis 1-26, let us make, that's an, a third word, third verb, asa for what God's doing. Humankind, the creation of humankind is actually described <clears throat> with three verbs, bara, yatsar, and asa. That tells you that they all overlap in meaning. And in Exodus 20.11, guess what is asa? Made. The very word we have here for make, and we find out that humankind is made, is formed from pre-existing material. Guess what is made, not barad, in Exodus 20.11? The heavens and the earth. Okay, let's look it up. Let's go there real quickly. This is the Ten Commandments chapter. For in six days the Lord made, right here, asa. It's not bara. Now, I look at this and say, well, that's interesting, big deal, because they're synonyms. It is a big deal if you want to say that bara has to mean a certain thing, creation out of nothing. It doesn't, and so this, this issue doesn't solve anything. But the meaning of bara does not get you anywhere when it comes to, well, which, which flow of the verses is correct? You know, is it... Is it the traditional view where God's first creative act is in verse 1, or is it this, this Hebrew syntax view where God's first creative act is in verse 3? Bara doesn't help you with that. Yom doesn't help you either. Now, the argument goes that Yom in Genesis 1 has to mean 24-hour days because it's grouped with a numeral. Any of you who have spent much time reading about Genesis are familiar with this, this argument. Yom by itself can mean an assortment of things. In fact, if you go back to Genesis, we just read it back in Genesis 2. Let's just go here. I'll type it in here. Okay. Well, let's go up a little bit. All right. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. By the way, let's click on that. When they were broad in the day the Lord God made Asa. See, they overlap. In the day that God made the earth and the heavens. Like, did God do everything in one day? One 24-hour cycle? Well, no. In this case, Yom refers back to the previous six days. It's more than 24 hours. Now, you can go through the Old Testament and look for Yom until your, your mind is numb. And yes, I've done that. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> uh, and you'll find that, that Yom can mean a 24-hour cycle. It can mean a long, long time, like the day of the Lord, even future time. It can mean, you know, some indefinite period. It usually means daytime. In other words, they meant the same thing by it that we do when we say day. 
Okay, pick up anything. Chances are when you see the word day in a newspaper or something like that, it's referring to daytime when the sun's out. That's usually what it means. When it's grouped with a number, it doesn't really help. I'll give you a couple instances here where you have the exact same phenomenon you get in Genesis 1, yom plus a number. This is Jacob and Laban, that whole incident. He took his kinsmen with him and pursued him. Laban is pursuing Jacob. Pursued him for seven days and followed close after him. Now, do you really want to press the point that Laban and his men traveled for seven consecutive 24-hour cycles without stopping? That's absurd. They traveled seven times when it was daytime, seven days. That's that's what you would do. You wouldn't ride during the night, and you certainly wouldn't try to go for seven in a row. It's not like they're trying to get, get some record or something. It's not like the Great Chase or whatever that show is, Great Race. Here's another one. Jacob and Esau, when they finally get reunited, Jacob said to him, you know, Esau says, hey, why don't you come over to my place? And Jacob, or Esau says that to Jacob. Jacob doesn't really want to do that. Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. If they're driven hard for one day, all the flocks will die. Now, what, what's he saying? You know, if you drive them for 24 hours, they're probably going to die. 20, 21, now we can probably make that. No, he's saying daytime. He's not thinking like we are. Okay, 24-hour units. He's thinking, well, this is when you travel. It's day. If we do this for one more day because we've been on the run for quite a while, they're going to die. So he doesn't want to do that. Now, the traditional view, I don't want you to go away thinking that there's nothing to the traditional view because you do have the slim possibility of the vow. The vow is... Masoretic, it's medieval. You also have a few other considerations. Okay, what about, you know, the the, the material? Again, if I, I'm going to try to argue uh, in the next couple of weeks, my personal view is that Genesis has nothing to do with science at all. It was completely the questions we ask of it, the things we're concerned about, wouldn't even have even popped into the mind of an ancient Israelite at all. Genesis is really about theological messaging. And I'm going to show you some very specifics because there are things that are happening in Genesis that are direct slaps in the face of certain ideas in the ancient world associated with other deities who claimed that their gods were their god or gods were the creator. And there are little things in the text that say no 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 you're wrong. You're like really wrong. You don't have a prayer, pardon the pun, of being right. Okay, It's theological messaging. They're not concerned with, they're not Darwinists. They're not post-Darwinists. They don't, they don't know anything about the questions that are in our minds. And I love to point this out to people who criticize uh, Genesis or origins by saying, oh, Genesis, you know, it's just scientifically inaccurate, blah, 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 blah. My, my first question is, why would you criticize the Bible, Genesis, for not being something it was never intended to be? Can you, like, explain that to me? Can you explain why that's at all coherent? That's like me criticizing my boy for not being a girl. Okay. It was never intended. I mean, this is, this is what he is. He's not that, so I'm not going to... You're criticizing the Bible for not being something it isn't, and it wasn't supposed to be. If you can make sense of that argument to me, then we can have a discussion. Because if you can't, then your argument is, like, totally worthless. I mean, let, let's go at it from some other angle. Let's take it for what it is. Because what it's really saying is that there was a creation event. God is responsible, the God of the Bible. Okay, can science disprove that? You can hate it all you want, okay, but there's no way to empirically defeat it. And I know that, and most atheists who've been around the block 
get that as well. They're going to argue with you about something else. And it's usually the character of the book. But I, 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 I actually enjoy that because I want you to justify the stupidity of your assertion. And I don't say that, but that's what I'm after. I, that's what I want from you. Justify the stupidity of the question you just asked me. And then we can talk. Okay. You're going back to the, to the traditional view, though. If, if you know, this is something, you know, I, I realize I was, it took a while. It was, it was really when I learned Hebrew that I learned, oh, boy, you know, we got something else going on here. There's one possibility, and that is Isaiah 40.21. This would be the way I think you, you could possibly defend the traditional view. It says, do you not know, do you not hear, has it not been told you from the beginning? Notice the phrase, from the beginning. Guess what? There's no definite article at beginning, just like in Genesis 1. And you look at the verse, and, and we, we sort of intuitively know that Isaiah is talking about Genesis 1, isn't he? Would there be some other beginning in Isaiah's head besides the one in Genesis 1? Well, I can't really think of any other beginning Isaiah would have in mind. So it's possible to argue that despite the syntax, despite the grammar, Isaiah looked at Genesis 1.1 as the beginning. That's possible. You could also say he's looking at Genesis 1.1 and thinking of it the way the Hebrew syntax view would think of it, the whole the whole series of events. There's ambiguity here. So the traditional view, uh, I don't, you know, my, my own view is that it doesn't, it's not supported the most easily, but it is possible. Okay, but you need Isaiah 40 to come along and help you. Now we have a few questions, or a few uh, minutes. I'd be glad to take any questions, but I, let, me, let me just prep by saying, the rest of the weeks by saying this. If you look at Genesis, again, I, the one thing I wanted you to get is to understand why guys like Bruce Waltke, why Hebrew scholars, uh, who care? Who, who cares about the days? Who cares about the time sequences? Who cares about you know, the long eons and the millions? Of, this is why they don't care. Because if you have indefinite time going on in the first two verses, let's just go back. If you have indefinite time, and the creation really only starts in verse 3, and the writer presupposes that, you know, there was stuff there, yeah, we'll give God credit for it, but we have no time sequence before verse 3. You could very easily argue, sure, once creation starts, once verse 3 starts, you got six 24 hour days, you got a Sabbath day, great. But you got eons of time before that because there was something there already. That's why they don't care. It's very easy to mount that defense and just leave it there. And many Old Testament scholars do. Okay, I wanted you to, to realize what, what the thinking is. And I also, again, because I'll bring it up in the next three weeks, there is great value in pointing out to people exactly what the text says and asking them to defend their idea and letting the Bible be what it is. It's about who's God and who's creator. doesn't mean it says anything wrong in these other areas. I mean... Ancient people, Dax uh, brought up uh, an example, was it a week ago, about the humors and some other things. Um, I'll show you a few examples where there, the one you, you brought up is the, the notion that the seat of our emotions and our intellect and our will is our intestines, according to the Bible. Well, no, it's not. In fact, you won't even see it. There is no Hebrew word for brain in the Old Testament. They don't know anything about brain science at all. Okay, they knew by experience that when they were uptight about something, or they could feel it. Now we know that there's a reason for that because this is connected to like everything else, because of this thing we call the nervous system. Okay, we know that they didn't, but they, they could experience this. 
There's nothing going off like in their head, bodily signals, you know, like it is in your gut. You, know, you all know what I'm talking about. So that, that's a very natural thing to presume. It's completely pre-scientific. It's a presumption. The issue is, can someone's presumption still be very useful to communicating things that are absolutely true? Even if the presumption is flawed, does it really have anything to do with truth claims? And I'm going to suggest to you that it doesn't. Okay. I'm not going to tip my hand with any illustrations here. But there are things in, about Genesis that are in that territory. And I think it's very useful, again, for insisting that people, if you want to pick on it, if you want to attack my Bible, you need to begin by letting it be what it is. Don't erect your, strong, your straw man. Don't tell me what you think it is and then shoot at it when it's not. Because okay, it's not hard to destroy that. Right. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. Concerning verse 2, mm -hmm. isn't there a text in Jeremiah or Isaiah that's contradiction if you don't want it? Says yeah. That the earth was not created without a it was. It, you're, you're thinking of Isaiah 40? Verse 18. It's in that same passage that we were just at. Yeah, it says, let's just go there quick. Oh, let's see. Oh, no, it's 45. I think I'm going, I think I got this right. Yes. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God who formed the earth and made it. There you go again. You have Barah and other words made and formed. They're synonyms. He established it. He did not create it empty. Okay, that's bohu. That's the second of the two things in Genesis 1. Uh, now the earth was tohu vabohu, formless and empty. And here we have the statement, God didn't create it bohu. I, I actually don't think... That's contradictory because of what follows. We, we may pick that up in, in another week. But the, the statement here is he didn't create it with the intention of it remaining uninhabited. So it started out that way because before you have people, it's uninhabited. Okay? <laughs> Just put our thinking caps on. Uh, you know, it, it has to be empty because there are no people. Okay? That's the way that works. So I don't think there's a contradiction there at all, but that is often referred to. Anybody else? Wow, what a rousing round of questions that was. <laughs> yes, Dags. That, that's entirely possible. And let me, let me just explain why that sort of impulse is there. You see in Genesis 2-4, these are the generations of the heaven and earth. If you've read through Genesis, you know that that phrase, these are the generations of, occurs like 25 times. I mean, it just occurs all over the place because Genesis is about beginnings. So you have the generations of this guy and that guy and this family and this thing. This phrase moves you through the whole book. It divides the book into generations. A phrase like that is missing in the minds of some for chapter 1. And so that's why some people take 1 verse 1 as like the title of the book. It, it gives them literary closure, literary patterning consistency. And grammatically, it's certainly possible. I, I don't think it's necessary, but it, yeah, it's possible to, to let that stand by itself. And then that's a title, and then verse 2 sets up verse 3. So that would be an alternative to the Hebrew syntax view. Title, 
describing conditions that exist before God gets to work in verse 3. You will see that. Anybody else? Yes, sir. There, there are poetic sections uh, in these chapters. Um, realize that when we, when you talk about poetry with respect to English, English poetry rhymes in what? Sound. Okay, think of a song. Okay, you know the, the words sound the same. You you strike these correspondences in sound. Hebrew poetry does not work like that. Hebrew poetry rhymes in thought. If you look at Psalms or Proverbs, there's line one, line two, either echoes it or contradicts it, but says the same thing. Again, it, it, line one expresses a thought, line two expresses either that same thought in a different way. You have a lot of that going on in in non-poetry sections like Genesis. Okay, it's not just Psalms and Proverbs. The other thing you have going on is you have really large literary structures. The most famous one in Genesis 1 through 11 is chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. It's, in fact, commercial for Bible Study Magazine. Uh, there's an article, and I didn't write it, there's an article in Bible Study Magazine about exactly that for chapter 11. The whole chapter makes a series of points, and then there's a midpoint, and then everything beyond that echoes in order the 10 or 11 things that came before. That's deliberate. You know, that, there, there's, there's a, a lot of literary artistry that goes into it. And we should not take that and presume that that means that they didn't believe the content. See, a lot of people say, well, it's poetry. You can't really get theology out of poetry. Well, like, thank you for dismissing pretty much 90% of what we know about the ancient Near East and their literature, because that's all it is. I mean, they're, they believe it. They're just expressing what they think in a certain way. It's not that because it's poetry, it isn't real to them. Oh, it's very real to them. It's just not prose. It's not boring narrative. They're doing something a little fancier. You know, you got a lot of that going on in Genesis. Anybody else? Sure. Sure, you'll 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 get you'll get some of that. It you don't get it's not terribly pronounced. Um, I'm trying to think in the other than Genesis. There's, there's poetry proper, parallelism, and then there are things called that we would loosely call literary features, literary techniques. You have that pretty much everywhere, even in prose. Uh, the strict forms of parallelism are spotty, but you have, you have deliberate structure to what's going on uh, practically everywhere in the Hebrew Bible. It's a piece of, it, it's, it's literary art. It's not random. You know, I, I used to tell my students, who were sort of put out about, you know, we, we would talk about editing of the Bible, okay? Uh, the Bible bears lots of marks of editorial work, okay, more than one hand. And that, that would freak people out until I gave them the holy stapler illustration. I do not believe in the holy stapler. You say, what's the holy stapler, Mike? Well, imagine yourself as the, you know, one of the followers of the prophet Ezekiel, and, or Isaiah, I mean, pick any prophet you like. And you're one of his followers. So what do you do every day? You get up, and if it's Ezekiel, the first thing you ask yourself is, is he going to do anything weird today? Like, is he going to wear clothes today or not? So if you're, if you're, if you're with somebody normal, <laughs> you'd probably ask, is he going to go out and preach today? So you go out, you go listen to Isaiah preach. And that was a pretty good sermon. You're getting this down, you know, so maybe, maybe you're writing some of it down. Maybe you're just storing it away in your memory. Maybe you're going to write it down when you get back. But eventually, a lot of what this guy's preaching gets written either by himself or somebody else. It's called the school of the prophets is the Old Testament term. Okay, they produced scripture. Let's say Isaiah kicks the bucket. Now what do you do? Hey, you know, the master's dead. What do we do? Hey, do you, you know, well, okay, here's what we do. You get all your stuff together, everything you wrote down, all the sermons and everything. We got to collect it. 
because we know it's from God. We've got to hand it to posterity. We've, we've got to get it together so it's not lost. So everybody brings their notes. And now what does the leader do now? Okay, put them on a pile right here. Got all the scrolls here or whatever on a pile. He shuffles them, makes sure the sides are even, and says, anybody got a stapler? It's ridiculous. You know what he says? Is anybody here really good at writing? Do we have a good editor here? Because it has to make sense when it's done. We have to fashion it into a book. It's still his stuff. But we've got to make it into a beautiful, coherent, readable thing because we care about it. We're not just going to go, ka chunk, oh, add that to the pile. Put that in the Ark of the Covenant. That ought to go good. You know, it, that's just not how books are made. It's never how books are made. Okay? Has, that's part of the process of inspiration. If you believe God was in the process, okay, why is that so earth-shattering to have more than one hand? Can't God control more than one person at a time? Of course he can. Okay, it's just how books are made. The ancient world is no different. And if this were Old Testament class, we'd look at some examples. But anybody else? I love the Holy Stabler story. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, beginning of the session, he gave us two ways to translate the first verse again. Mm -hmm. And they were different, different words and different meanings. Mm -hmm. Would you say then that one of them is inaccurate? I would say that both are possible but the, the when translation is more defensible grammatically. I, I, that has more weight when it comes to grammar and syntax. Um, you could still, and people do, you could still translate the text in the quote-unquote traditional way and then through, a, through the, the art and science of exegesis make it say something that would be more in line with the second view. I mean, you can still do that. It's not dependent on the translation. But I, I think the one is more uh, defensible in terms of grammar and syntax. But I would, I would not say the other is... I, I would not say the other is, is uh, wrong or impossibly wrong, you know, wrong because it's not possible. Because there is enough... There's enough ambiguity where I can't... I personally can't bring myself to say that. I understand when when people do, because they're you know they're pretty zealous you know for the rules of the grammar there. But I I, I think that's a little too categorical. Even though I'm I'm with the second one myself. Yes, sir. I, I think it, it's just a question of history and time. You know, it's it's the. You know, the, let's take the King James. Um, the King James is is a very good translation. Uh, it is by no means perfect. I I can say this because I've literally been through every syllable of the translation, comparing it to the Hebrew, because Dale wanted it done. <laughs> That was one of my jobs a couple of years, and, and I enjoyed it because I felt like I owed something to the King James. You know, I was sort of raised on that. And it's a very good translation, but you can tell that there are uneven levels of ability in a translator where some just have an appreciation for this thing going on that others don't. Uh, even within a translation, because King James was a committee translation. So, and when it when it came out in the beginning, I don't I don't think it's it's a it's a cosmological statement situated in the history of science for what was going on at the time. I don't I don't think they're thinking of that. I think they're just doing the best they can. And logically, in their mind, they're they're thinking, well, you know, what other beginning would there be? And it just makes more sense this way. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. But once that's sort of canonized as a translation. It becomes something that you're really hesitant to change. I mean, you can change like a thousand other things 
in Genesis. But it's like that one verse. You know, everybody knows that one. So we don't want to you know, fiddle with that one. Translators do make, and I, hate, I hate this word in this context, but they, they do make compromises like that. Um, so I think it's just the result of familiarity and, and uh, in that case, uh, a real desire for consistency. You know, some of the newer translations like NRSV, they're, they're sort of losing that predilection to, to preserve that, getting away from it a little bit. A little bit. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. It's really, it's really hard to tell what a given translator is thinking. Uh, even if, let's go to Genesis one one here. Now, if anybody knows Greek, we have N R K. We do not have a definite article there. So, to, to be really strict, you would say, in beginning, or idiomatically, to begin with, or when God made the heavens and the, you know, you, you initially would be a good word. Initially God created. But again, that leaves an incomplete thought. It, le- it, it feels like it's, it's leading somewhere as opposed to being, you know, definite point in time. And in the, in the case of the Septuagint here, they do not have the article. But sometimes with the, the Septuagint translator, you don't know if he just doesn't know Hebrew that well. You don't know if he's just like, oh, I just feel like paraphrasing a little bit today. Or, uh, and it, it's, it's uneven. Again, it's not done by one person. It's all the way across the board. And there are some, some things that just are completely unexplainable. I'll give you an example. Isaiah 9.6. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. You know, all those names, none of them are in the Septuagint. There it says he shall be called the Messenger of the Great Council. I love that verse. <laughs> those of you who know me know I love that verse. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't know if he's looking at a different Hebrew text that he's working with. Or if that's just like something that popped into his head. Is it highly interpretive or does he have a different text? You know, it, it's hard to know. I mean, there are mechanical ways to try to come up with possibilities and sort of rank the probabilities, but, you know, it's hard to know. Dax. I just, you know, we've got lots of questions close to being done, but can you speak for a moment towards you no know, to be left with, well, you need to be a Semitic scholar to trust your English Bible. And how much can yeah. you say? Yeah, what I think I think we need to realize that Bible study is really not Bible reading. Okay, Bible study takes work. It takes thinking, okay, about the text. And a lot of what you saw me do tonight, you could do with English if you just ask the right questions. If you compare translations, because you'll run into into like if you run into the JPS Torah, you know, you're going to go. When God began to create, what in the world are they thinking there? You know, I mean, is that possible? Is that is that you know for real translation? I mean, it got published. It's a real publisher. It's not like something on the internet that you know. Uh, and they're Jewish, you know. Don't they? they should know what they're doing here a little bit, you know. Um, if you compare translations, and there really is no substitute for thinking about what you're reading thinking about it, spending real time, and I'm going to use the C word here, reading it critically. Okay, just because you ask a question about the text doesn't mean that God is offended. You don't need to go repent for that, okay? God expects you to to use the brain power that he's given you to think about what he's dispensed, what he providentially has preserved for you to read. Um. You know, it, it's the Berean thing, you know, going on. I mean, we, it's not just about reading. It's about thinking, lingering over it and really thinking. And, and if you have good tools, again, to compare things, you can go a long way if you're just willing to, to put in the seat time and expose yourself to different sources, different thinkers, different preachers that just get you stimulated, you know, to think. It's a never-ending process. 
I mean, to me, it's an endless fascination. My wife can bear witness to the fact that she pretty much sees the back of my head most of the time when I'm in. <laughs> um, and I'm usually doing something you know, related to this because it, it, it just becomes, it's just an endless fascination. And, and the, all, the, all the, you know, getting into the languages, it's not all that it does for you, but it, the, the, the set of questions you have become different because you're, you're paying attention to different things. One of the best things, I'll, I'll leave with this tip, use an interlinear. Okay, I, I would recommend learning an alphabet and using the interlinear for one reason only. It slows you down. It forces you to read slowly. We often, because we're English sight readers, we just whip through content. We just whip right through it. And we miss a lot of what's going on there. If you just slow down, you know, it, it'll, it'll do wonders for you.